much. Um, but in short, we have uh, not only you can access this webinar, but you'll be able to access all the past recordings we've done. We have a webinar coming up next month with uh, very, very good engineer in the industry. And there's also webinar training courses that are available throughout the year provided by ITI that actually cover ITI course curriculum. Okay. So um, about your speakers today, Mike Parnell, he's an industry expert. He's been in the industry for over 30 years. He's currently the vice chairman of ASME B30. That's the main committee which sets the standards in the U.S. and is recognized by uh, Canada and Mexico and other countries in the Western Hemisphere, really, as a standard for cranes and rigging equipment. Uh, he's also the chairman of the ASME P30 committee, uh, which is a new committee he'll be talking about that sets standards now for lift planning. So um, please note that the, although Jim and Mike are both uh, members of ASME, uh, the information shared here is definitely their opinions and not that of ASME. So uh, Jim Yates, this is the second time Jim's been on, and we're so happy to have him. He's uh, just a brainiac, I can tell you, from this stuff. And um, I'm actually going to ask Jim after this presentation to present this live in New York in November because we're holding a power gen lifting workshop. But Jim, as you can see, has a professional engineer, uh, senior VP of engineering and technical services at Barnhart. Uh, before joining Barnhart in 97, I mean, he's a Naval Academy graduate and was a, at Tennessee Valley Authority. As a, and have held a nuclear uh, reactor operator's license. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, Jim, if he still has it. Maybe you can comment on that. But I'd love to pick his ear on that. But Barnhart, too, you guys, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, just the leader in the United States in uh, advanced and heavy lift and transport, 25-time rigging job of the year award winner. Uh, Barnhart is while Yates has been there. So Jim, I know you won't let them down. I know that was a pretty hefty um, introduction to you. but I'm going to turn them over to you and, uh, yeah, take it away. Great. Thanks, Zach. And Zach, I take it you can see my screen now, so we're all set to go? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to thank ITI for the opportunity to get together and speak with everybody. Um, as you know, heavy rigging and transports what, what we do, but I think the forums where we can all get together with our customers and those who are interested in heavy rigging and transport uh, makes us all a better and safer community as we as we serve the general public and, and each other. So uh, I'd like to thank ITI for the opportunity to get together and, and speak. Today I'm going to be talking about logistical and site considerations for heavy power plant components. And as you guys know, there's lots of new power plants being built around the country um, as we look to replace the aging power plant fleet as well as meet the increased demand for electricity in our in our country. And every one of those new power plants has got lots of big heavy components that need to be safely delivered to the site. And with that comes lots of things to consider when we plan the activities around these big heavy components coming into these sites. We're going to be specifically addressing the logistics and the site preparations uh, for moving all those heavy components. So what I'm looking at doing is we're going to talk about first what heavy components we're, that, that we're going to focus on. And uh, it's I'm going to address typically the combined power plant cycle, but I'll also real briefly talk about things for uh, like uh, wind energy sites. And I think I've got some other uh, pictures in there for uh, uh, solar and some other things. But we're, we're, we're mostly going to look at the, those for the combined power plants for the gas turbine um, industry because uh, they seem to be the ones that are putting the most up right now. Um, well. The logistical considerations that we're going to look at is uh, ship and port, uh, rail, and then we'll look at barging, and we'll also consider the over-the-road transport, which can be some of the most challenging parts of our planning to get these components to the site. And then lastly, I'm going to address the site considerations, what we've got to do to make sure our job site is ready to receive these components. In a typical combined cycle gas turbine plant, we have uh, several major components that we need to look at. Uh, the combustion turbine, which is over here on the right, if you can see my mouse, that's a typical combustion turbine. And uh, these components that I'm looking at on my screen all range in weight from anywhere from 200,000 pounds, which would be a small HRSG module, all the way up to a, uh, a steam generator, which can weigh in excess of 400 tons. And so 
all those components have got uh, lots of things that got to be looked at before we start dragging them down the road or offloading them from the ship or lifting them on our job site. So combustion turbines, combustion generators, HRSGs or heat recovery steam generators, steam turbines, high pressure and low pressure, steam generators and transformers are the typical major components that are the heaviest things that got to be transported and then lifted on these new uh, combined cycle gas power plants. The size of the weights of these components really determines uh, and, and presents those unique challenges for any project logistics. And failure to do our due diligence can be pretty disastrous to us. As you see in this picture, this was a, a, a platform trailer that was delivering a gas turbine uh, in an India power plant several years ago, and it collapsed the bridge. So this is what we're attempting to avoid when we do our proper planning. Many of the components that, uh, that come into the U.S. Um, are obviously not manufactured here. Some of them are. And so what I want to first talk about is the ship and port considerations for those components that are delivered to the U.S. Um, we're going to look at the ship considerations themselves, which is the, the LHE or the load handling equipment on the, on the ship, the position of the ship at the dock, the stability we've got to consider on the ship, and then the strength of the ship, and we'll particularly focus on the ramps. Um, and then we'll also look at some environmental issues, um, some port considerations, uh, LHEs at the port themselves, and, and some of the issues there, as well as the dock strength of each of the ports. A lot of the ships come into the port, and they've got equipped, and they are equipped with heavy lift uh, gear on board. And so they can do a lot of self-loading uh, as well as self-unloading. One of the things that you've got to consider, though, is you need to look at the load charts because depending on where these cranes come in, that may affect how far they can reach out and unload their equipment or, or where they're actually going to put the equipment, whether it's on the rail or whether it's onto a barge to the side of them. Um, so you've got to look at the load charts and make sure that the, the lift and the set radius for the loads uh, is going to be within the capacity of that, that of the cranes on board the ship. Sometimes the ships come in and they're not equipped with a, an adequate LHE. And so then you have to look at alternative plans uh, such as like this uh, floating heavy lift crane. This is down the port of Mobile and uh, it's, got a, it's got a reel, an underwater reel that it's unloaded from the ship. And so you, it may require that you go to a port that's got an LHE. So if you're bringing it into a port that doesn't have a heavy lift capacity uh, or heavy lift uh, ship equipped with its own LHE, you're going to have to go to a port that's got one. LHE inspection and maintenance records are something that we typically make sure we review prior to receiving the uh, equipment from, from one of these heavy lift ships, uh, especially if we're anywhere close to the heavy lift ship's LHE capacity. Um, there's a lot of high risks and on some of these lifts, so you may, it may warrant that you've got a test of the LHE before you actually lift the components. Um, there's been lots of industry events over the last probably 10 years where, uh, like in this case, this was a vessel that was dropped um, when the line, load line for the LHE on the jumbo ship there failed. And so obviously if you're bringing your gear in, this can be catastrophic to your project. It can also cause uh, injury or death. So once we've looked at the LHE, another thing to look at is the dock position. Um, these are very busy ports that these ships come into, and ship position is important to ensure our lift and efficiency. If you have improper ship position, it may cause our lift plan to become invalid. If we expected to lift over the side onto a, onto a barge, and that barge can't get anywhere close to the ship, now you've got a busted lift plan. It can cause a lot of logistical headaches for you. So the ship position may need to be changed uh, to accommodate the capacity of the LHE, whether it's a dockside LHE, a ship's gear, or a mobile crane. So again, knowing where it's coming in and where it's going to be positioned before your transporter arrives, whether it's by, by barge or, or a transporter or, or even rail, you've got to make sure that your ship can actually make the lift or the LHE that you're using can make the lift to put, it, to put the heavy component where you want it. Ship stability, you know, when you think about heavy rigging, you think, well, that's really not something to be considered. Um, it really is important. Um, ship stability has got to be maintained during lifting operations. And a lot of these 
the ships come in, they may only have five components in them, but they're so heavy that it affects the ship's stability during the lift. And, and those, the LHE cranes that are on board these ships um, need to move very slowly to allow the ship to compensate with ballasting water. And uh, this, is a, this is a very high risk maneuver for these big uh, heavy lift ships. So most of the time, the ship's crew determines the ballast plan to maintain stability, maintain stability during the lift. And that, that plan ought to be part of a lift plan that we put together if, if we're receiving these components, or at least make sure the contractor you've entrusted it to is, has got that in his plan, um, and then communicate that well to our team. Um, sometimes for complicated or high-risk lifts, uh, you need to get a naval arc or a marine architect uh, involved to validate the ballasting plan for these ships. Again, stability failures, um, like the rest of the failures we look at, like that bridge I showed you, can be really, really disastrous. Um, back, back in the early, or early 2000, it was 2003, um, the Stellamar, which, is a, which was a heavy lift ship, was onloading power plant components, and uh, the power plant components shifted, and uh, the ship actually flipped over on its side, as you can see in these pictures here, and three of the guys that were on board the ship were killed. Um, so stability is, a, is not to be taken lightly when you're talking about these heavy components, whether they're going off the ship or onto the ship. Another thing to consider is the ship's strength itself. And for the sake of our discussion, we're only going to talk about the ramp strength. Uh, we're going to assume that the ship owners have already accounted for the ship's structural strength to support heavy loads. The ship owners and the heavy transport company need to get together and communicate the loads uh, for the onload and offload operation, um, since those loads are going to be dependent upon the equipment that they use. So if I'm if I'm going on here with a with a heavy platform trailer, uh, I've got to give that that ship my loadings per axle and make sure that his ramp is strong enough for me to for me to go on board his ship, pick up the load, and then drive back off. You see in this picture right here, uh, we've got a heavy component coming off on a on a hydraulic platform trailer, and you see that we've already gone on, we've picked up the load, and now we're back and back down the ramp. So those are heavy axles, and those axles put down some pretty considerable load, more so than a normal uh, highway load on a truck would put down. So you've got to coordinate that and make sure that those things are properly considered. I want you also to note, if you look at my, uh, my mouse over here, I'm circling these blue beams. Um, this is something uh, for efficiency's sake that's got to also be coordinated. Uh, if you've got this heavy load loaded in there, a lot of times they load them on with cranes and you want to get in there and pick them up and you don't have that same crane, uh, you want to be able to self-load and, and self-unload. Um, so having, having that coordination between the, uh, the shipper and the receiver or the guy that's got the transport, um, this load right here was actually lifted up on those beams and supported so the trailer could get up underneath it and then lift it without the assistance of additional equipment or jacking. Um, so it's a very efficient way to do it. But again, the coordination is the key here. If you don't coordinate it, um, it can cost our clients or, or, or your project a lot more money if you've got to get in there and then pick this thing up with some other means. If the transporter can just get underneath it and raise up its platform trailer to receive the load, it means you got a much more efficient and obviously less costly um, evolution. Also at the port, we've got some environmental considerations we want to take a look at, whether it's weather related, tidal and current effects, and then there's some interesting environmental laws we need to touch on real quick. So wind limits, just like a crane uh, that you have on your job site, these LHEs at the ports, whether it's the ship or a, or a port LHE, they've got limits. And so when you pick up normal loads, um, or, or every one of these LHEs has got a particular load chart associated with it with a particular size that they assumed uh, for wind loading. And when you get really large components like the one on the right, or, 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 or a, a component that is real subject to high sail areas like that blade that you're showing on that lower picture for a wind turbine, you may have to take special considerations. Uh, to account for that large sail area. Sometimes you even need engineering restrictions to be put on the maximum wind speed if you've got a particularly very large object or something that's got a high sail area associated with it. 
Wave limits at these ports can also be an issue, even though you might be in a, in a secluded port. Um, you've got to check to make sure that the LHE that you're going to be using is going to, is going to be able to do its operation within the limits uh, for wave action in the port. You can see here it's pretty calm. This particular barge and crane that's on it's got a two-foot wave limit, which is pretty small. The tide and current considerations uh, is another thing that's got to be looked at when you're bringing these, these components in. At a typical dock, it's usually not a big deal, but if you're coming into an area that, is, that doesn't have a dock, like if you're using a barge to unload something, the tidal effects can really be um, uh, big. And so it affects your moorings, it can affect your water depth, and, and obviously your station keeping when you're trying to move these heavy components. So the effect of the tide and the current is something that needs to be looked at throughout the operation if you're going to be working on water. And we'll talk a little bit about this when I get into the barging, where we talk about transporting things with barges. The local environmental laws are, need to also be considered. Uh, a lot of the ports in the U.S. now have rules and laws associated with ballasting discharge. Um, everybody who's been around a power plant knows about you know, snails getting up into their intakes and things. So um, because of these restrictions, a lot of the ports now won't let you take water in one port and then discharge it into another one. And so when you're talking about loading a barge from a ship, this can be a really big deal, especially if they tell you you can't discharge it without processing the water. And so if you go from one zone to another and the, the rules are different for each zone, this can be a big impact to your operation. It's something that's got to be addressed in your lift plan to make sure that when you start pumping water from that port, if it's got to be discharged, that it goes back in the port the way the, the local laws um, tell you to do it, or you can get into a, into a real bind. All right, the port itself, not just the ship, but the port's also got limits. If you look at like a port LHE, like that crane I've been showing there in Mobile, um, again, just like the LHE on the boat and the ships, you need to look at the LHE limitations by looking at their charts to plan your lifts accordingly. This is particularly true if you've got a ship coming in that doesn't have its own lifting gear. You've got to, you've got to position your barge and and make your transfer of your load onto whatever you're going to, whether it's taking it off the ship, putting it on rail, or going off the ship on a barge, or putting it on the transporter. So the different configurations may be required based on where the thing's loaded into the ship. Sometimes we bring mobile cranes, like you see in the picture on the right, down to be our, our load handling equipment to offload equipment. And they've got their own special circumstances because of the loadings that they put down on the docks. So if you look, at, you look at a typical dock in a heavy lift port, it, it, it may be fine to handle the reaction loads for the outriggers on a crane, but it may not be if you've got um, really, really big loads or a, or a very large crane out there. And, so it, and if you're at a port that doesn't handle heavy loads, this is something that's really got to be considered. Normal truck loads are not that high compared to a, compared to a crane. Uh, when you look at a, a, a mobile crane, it can put down 10,000 PSF very easily, um, even with um, outriggers uh, and supports under those outriggers. 10,000 PSF is a big load. So special load spreading needs may need to be considered when you look at the offload uh, of, of, of your equipment. And the punching failures on docks are very common. Um, this was actually a parking garage, but it illustrates the point perfectly. Uh, this was a very large hydraulic crane that punched through a, uh, the deck on, on a parking garage, which would be similar to what you would see on a, on a, uh, on a dock. Most of those docks are just a, a poured slab on top of a uh, pile cap, so um, same, same kind of failures could be uh, happening if you're not careful. So we do look at the dock strength not only for our crane, but let's say we're unloading it onto a truck or even onto a transporter. Uh, those transporter loads also put down very high concentrated loads, and, and you, you've got to take a consideration for not only your LHE, but also what you're going to do with your, your equipment as you load it on a transporter. You can see down here you've got a, you got a, you got a transformer being offload on. It looks like two of them are going to come off because they've got two large platform trailers. These platform trailers can put down you know, up to 35 tons of axle line 
which is much more than like this this uh, this this truck up here with the wind blade on it is going to put down. And you may be staging it on on a, on equipment like over here. It looks like they're getting ready to stage this piece, which is a uh, which is a wind turbine um, component. And if you're going to stage it, you also have to consider what the staging loads on the dock are. All right. So after we've considered the ship. Now when you get, we're going to start looking at the logistics associated with taking the components from the port or the manufacturer's facility to our construction site. And we're going to, and we're going to consider the three main uh, ways that these heavy loads get moved. Um, one's by barge, the second is by rail, and then the third we're going to look at specialized trailers. So what do we got to look at on a barge? Um, barges need to be considered when you look at their, their deck strength and their global strength to be able to support these very concentrated loads. You look at a, an 800,000 pound transformer, it's a really small package and so you've got to consider these things like the deck strength and the global strength of the barge. Now the stability on the barge is a, is a big deal. A lot of these loads have high centers of gravity um, and, they, and they end up making the barge unstable so you've got to look at the barge's stability factors. If we're going to use a barge, we're typically going to be doing some kind of roll-on, roll-off evolution. Most power plants um, that are being built are near, are near water, and so a lot of times we bring these barges in and we, we push them up on the beach there, so to speak, and then you've got a row-row operation going on. There's a lot of things we're going to talk about as far as the safety and the planning for a row-row, especially if it's not in a dock situation where you're just going into, a, into an embankment. Position keeping on the barge is another thing to look at, load staging and then transport securement. So let's, let's briefly look at each one of these. The deck strength on a barge, since all barges, there's lots of different sizes of barges and they, they all have different, different deck strengths. Um, so each one of those things has got to be considered when you start talking about putting big loads down on the deck of a barge. Most barges can handle up to, you know, you know a typical barge strength is 1,500 pounds per square foot. Some of the bigger, heavier barges can take 4,000 pounds per square foot. But if you start looking at a, a concentrated load like a, like a turbine generator on four stands, you can have eight or 9,000 pounds being transferred to the deck of the barge. And so in that case, you may have to put something like a load spreader, like I've shown in that picture there, where you can put a concentrated load on and then it's spreading the load enough uh, in between maybe two truss sections on the barges or two bulkheads. So the barge has got to be strong enough to support all the loading conditions for what we're going to do to it. And you might need to consider things like load spreaders. There's also a global strength consideration on the barge. If you've got a really big load and you need to ballast it and do things with it, the, the barge is not, um, it's not infinite in its strength. And, and you can imagine, you guys, your engineers on board, you start, you start pumping water fore and aft and put a big load in the middle, you might get to a point where the barge globally can't handle the strength and obviously we don't want to break our barge in half. Barge stability is another one. There's been, there's been uh, lots of issues in the industry where you start talking about stability on barges and putting big loads on them. You can see how this big transformer getting ready to go to a nuclear plant here, how high that center of gravity is in relationship to the deck of the barge, which means the stability associated with that needs to be looked at um, very closely. Um, if you're going to do an open ocean tow, not only do you have to deal with just basic old stability calculations, but now you've got large wave action that comes into play and, and, and huge tie-down forces uh, associated with it. So if you're, if you're going anywhere but inland waters with your, your heavy loads as they're moving to your job site, um, you really need to spend, spend the effort to get uh, a naval arc or a structural engineer to take a look at your tie downs and your stability calculations associated with these barges. So ballasting plans, the other thing that helps you consider your, your stability. You know, where are you going to put the water such that it, it, it keeps the barge stable as we move it around? So after we've looked at the strength on the barge and the stability associated with it, now let's start talking about we're, we're, we're going to bring it to a job site. So in this case, I've got two pictures of two transformers that are coming into um, really unimproved embankments off of rivers. And this is, this is a very typical scenario. So the guys who are involved in, in job planning for these power plants need to really look at this hard. When you start talking about bringing big loads into unimproved embankments, 
there's lots of things that have got to be considered to make the civil uh, improvements such that you can bring a barge in. Everything from the depth of the water, um, so you got to look at how much the barge is drafting to the type of bottom it might be sitting in. A lot of times heavy transporters like us, we like to ground the barges because it makes them a little more stable, but sometimes that's not possible if you've got a very silty bottom or the, or the water depth drops away real quickly. Um, and so you end up with a floating roll off. And so those things become a big deal when we start talking about rolling off of these barges. And you can see in both areas, you've got barge ramps and then there's some kind of civil improvement or matting plan that's been done. The lower picture down here, there's a lot of civil improvement that was, that was done to bring this barge in. And those civil improvements could be any, everything from, from going out into the, the water itself and, and dredging it to make it deeper or clearing away debris like big rocks or something to bring our barge in, or putting in a bulkhead wall. You might have to drive sheet piles and create a wall um, there that's adequate to take the reaction loads. Because remember, those ramps are going to take all the loads. So you've got high reactions both on the barge as well as on the shore side that have got to be taken into account. So it, it isn't just scrape away the grass and uh, throw your mats down and go here. Uh, these are very, very high concentrated loads. And if you're not paying attention to what's going on with the, the reactions, both on the barge as well as on the, uh, on the land side, we, we can get into trouble really quickly. If you look here on this picture, um, this is a scenario where the, the deck of the barge and its adequacy was not considered prior to, prior to this roll-off operation. And you can see what happened. Uh, in the left-hand picture, the, the truss actually gave way and it caused the barge ramps to, to basically get unstable and the load on top of it went down and of course um, you don't have infinite control even with a good platform trailer and it put this transformer right in the water. So the structural adequacy, the landing, like I said, you also need to check it. If you look at this picture on the right, you can see there's been quite a lot of civil work done to bring in a, a road base and then you can see even on top of the road base they had to build the ramp up in order to bring the barge in. So the depth of the water a lot of times will dictate the height in which the barge is going to come in and of course the height of the barge then dictates how we're going to set this ramp up. You've got a very long trailer here. This, you know, this trailer is about 80 or 90 feet long and so we, you know, we, we have to have a very gradual slope in order to get the piece off of and onto the barge. So that might mean we have a considerable amount of civil work to do to build up this area. In the picture on the left, you can see here, we've built a bulkhead uh, and put crusher run in there, and then they've got, uh, we put steel plates down in order to help distribute the load to be able to take this reaction force as we're taking this, uh, this is a boiler, big D boiler coming off the, uh, this barge. So lots of civil work may be done here for row row operations. The other thing to look at is how we're going to control our barge. Um, many times you're bringing, it, you're bringing these pieces into, uh, into confined areas like a river and the currents can be quite fast, especially if you have large tidal swings. And so the tides themselves have to be considered because remember I said if the, if the barge is moving up and down, you can change the angle of the approach of your ramp such that you can't get on and off the barge with a long trailer. So, Knowing what's going on and being able to control the position of the barge, like with a tug like I've shown in this picture, and understanding the movement of the water near the barge, um, these are all things that have to be considered and put in your plan. So restraints become a big deal too. These restraints need to be designed because sometimes these forces that the, the current puts you in that that tug's pulling on can be quite high. I'm, I'm not a fan of the push it in and then let the tug go away, by the way. A lot of guys ask me, do you need a tug for a roll-off? Uh, in my years of experience, I highly recommend that there is a tug there to help control the barge. Um, if you start rolling off and the barge starts to move and you have no tug, you can be in a, a real bad situation. All right, other things to consider, similar on the ship where I talked about, the staging that goes on the barge is a big deal for making sure you've got efficiency in your roll-on and roll-off operation. You can see over here where I've got the red circle, they've actually used mats to help distribute the load as well as raise it up and you've got this transformer on these beams and uh, so that we can get underneath it real easily with our platform trailer. 
and this is, makes for a much more efficient roll-off operation. So load staging is a, is, needs to be something that's coordinated, uh, especially if you're using two different contractors, one to ship it up to you and one to receive it when it gets to the job site. Here's more pictures showing load staging. Sometimes you can't stage the load up high because of, uh, in, uh, you know, let's say a higher load obviously has a higher center of gravity, so you might have stability problems there, uh, or the tie-down forces become so high that it makes it impractical to store it up on stands. So in that case, you may have to bring in, like in this case, you've got a very large generator here, and they've had to bring in um, gantries to set up on the bars to pick it up in order to get the the platform trail underneath it. And again, whenever you start talking about lifting off of the deck of the barge, now we've got some high concentrated loads and you've got to consider deck strength and stability also. Once it's on the barge, another thing you've got to look at is the fact that you've got to secure this piece. And here's a, this is actually going to a refinery, but it illustrates the point quite well. If we're going to be on open ocean, which is where this was going, you can see there's lots of change to secure the, the uh, transporter and then chains also to provide longitudinal stability and, and restraint for the piece itself. So lots of chaining went on here to make sure that those reaction forces were going to be able to be handled well. Right, so that's a barge. One of the other ways to, to uh, that we'll move things is that we will we will typically use rail. Rail has its own challenges, and we're going to talk about some of those things. But the big things to consider is the load size. And then the other thing that gets in the way a lot or something that people overlook is the, the tie-down design. Um, the rail companies are very particular about how they want you to tie down loads on rails. So let's, let's take a look at these things. The load size uh, may actually make transport unfeasible. If it's too big, there's just no way for it to, to fit through these things. You can see here um, how close of tolerance that this large vessel's got going through here. And I've seen transformers where literally it was a half an inch clearance on the, on the, uh, on the rail route between uh, obstacles. Uh, we actually had one job where we had, to, we had to shift the transformer two or three inches just to make it so it could get by a, uh, a, a bridge abutment. So, so there's, there's route surveys are really important here, and there's several companies out there that you can get, like Strategic uh, uh, Rail Transport. They're, they're a company that will go do a route survey for you and help you coordinate moving these big, heavy loads um, through here. So um, load size can be a, a, a big uh, consideration here when we're using our rails. The other thing is these tie-downs. Um, the rail companies don't really recognize really, really heavy loads as being different in their tie-down designs. And so whether I'm moving a car on a rail car or I'm moving a 1,000-ton a, a vessel, vessel like this, um, they make the rail tie-downs the same. And so you can see all this big red steel back here. This was all in, an, in accordance with to, uh, to handle the very high G-forces that rail securement um, requires. So that's another thing that um, you have to make sure that you've got in your plan. Before you uh, before you load it, this this is a surprise. You don't want the rail inspector to come out and uh, and shut you down. You could be there for weeks waiting to get the thing moved. So now we've talked we've talked about the barging. We've talked about the rail. Now let's talk about trailers. When we're talking about over the road transport, specialized trailers are what's usually going to be chosen to move these heavy loads. Um, there was a job that happened a couple of years ago where um, a generator came from overseas and it was supposed to go up through Virginia uh, and Tennessee up through the hills and uh, they got in trouble getting a permit and it, um, it actually delayed the delivery of the generator for almost a year and so it's really important that we look at the things that we need to be considering for these over-the-road specialty trailer transports of very heavy loads. Um, and so we're going to look at staging the piece for cell phone load. We're going to look at the load support. We already talked a little bit about the dock and then route surveys where I want to spend a little more time. So here's that same picture. We talked about staging. It's super important. These trailers, if they can self-load, uh, it's a big deal. It really makes the job much more efficient. The dock, we've talked briefly about it, but again, there's a platform trailer 
Uh, let's make sure we've got good adequate support before we put that big load on it. Now I'll spend a little more time on permitting. All states require that you permit heavy loads uh, before they're transported. And so this is an area that if, if it's overlooked can cost your job both in time as well as money uh, because it, it, every state is different. Um, if you're transporting in the state of California, it's way different than if you're transporting a heavy load in the state of Texas. And so when you start looking at going from state to state, this process of permitting can take a very long time. I've seen permit um, permitting of, of big loads spend literally a million dollars of engineering and took six months of planning to go through all the bridges just to move a generator, the one I talked to you about, from the east side of, of Tennessee up through the mountains into Virginia. Um, it was a very expensive endeavor for the client who underestimated it, and it, uh, it was a it was it was pretty pretty disastrous for their for their client. So route surveying is is a big deal. You see pictures over here, just taking a look at making simple turns. There's some devices we use in the route surveying business to get out there and make sure that we can move these loads. So we want to look at clearances. The big ones are clearances, structural adequacy, and topography of the land when you're talking about moving big, heavy loads with these specialized transporters. So you can see here, this uh, upper in the right-hand picture, um, the clearances are really, really important. Somebody's got to go out there and get in advance and make sure that that load can get underneath those bridges. And then if you take a real congested area like the picture on the left, where you've got lots of power lines, you've got, you've got uh, traffic turn signals, if you're going to drive your big tall transformer through the center of this town and that's the only place you can go, there's a whole lot of coordination that's got to be done once you figure out um, who owns the lines and how they've got to be either picked up, dropped, um, or just in, in general moved or de-energized. A lot of coordination with all those lines going through an area like that. The other thing is the structural adequacy, especially as it relates to bridge. Um, the bridges will typically on heavy loads be the thing that determines the type of trailer you can use for transports. And like I said, a lot of states have very, very particular bridge loading requirements that got to be considered. And these specialized transporters, many of them are designed specifically to get the loads spread out enough where the bridges can take the imposed loads. So here's some examples. Typical on-site um, generator moving around, you can, you can probably uh, get a load like this. Let's say we were going from a roll-off site that was on the river and you were just transporting it not over public roads but just bringing it straight to the site. You could get away with this kind of transporter. Now, this transporter puts down much more than 20,000 pounds an axle line, which is for general rule of thumb is what the DOT is going to permit. So if you wanted to take this thing on a public road, the answer is most likely going to be no. You're not going to be able to permit it in that condition. So then we have to consider something different. So in this case, in order to get this platform trailer across this bridge with this generator, we had to add dolly wings to the outside, which again distributes the load further out on more beams on the bridge, which allows the bridge to be able to support that load. Sometimes, because of the spacing of the axles on these heavy platform trailers, there's just no way to permit them, even if you put dolly wings on it. So in that case, what we end up with is using dollies and, uh, and bridging girders in order to spread the loads wider and wider in order to accommodate the bridge. So here's a scenario where we've got a big transformer being transported by a dolly rig. The other thing you note about this Look at the picture in the middle over here, how high that generator is. And now compare it to the, it's an equally high transformer, but it's down in the well of these girders. And so it allows you to put the load much closer to the ground as well as spread it out. So dollies are a really good method for these specialized transformers. You see a lot of companies like Barnhart's and the rest of them, Biggie, Mammut, uh, we all have similar systems that can work these things. Then if it really gets to be a big heavy load, you may have to go with something like this. Um, this load, uh, or this transporter rig, um, has got 28 dollies underneath it, and it, it can crab and change configurations in a way that allows you to do special dual lane loading. Um, so that's a big generator 
uh, it weighed almost, it was a little over 400 tons, and the whole rig itself was over 300 feet long and had 28 separate dollies underneath it with a large girder system on top with very high capacity um, lift capabilities to be able to move this thing around. So, so these are the these are the four main transformer or transporter types that you'll see out there for moving heavy loads. Topography is another one. You know, I just mentioned that that trailer was 300 feet long. Um, if you've got a 300 foot trailer driving around on on public roads, the route survey becomes really critical to make sure that when you go through these towns or go through even turns like this on a highway that you've considered the inside sweep as well as where the trailers physically can make it through. Going down a straight line is no big deal. Making a curve is a really big deal. So you can see here on this picture, we're, we're, we're going to go make this turn and you can see that we've got to do a large amount of civil improvement in order to make it around that corner. And so in this case, that civil improvement can be very expensive. And so making sure that you've considered it and planned it on the front end will keep you from having problems on the back end. Also, long trailers that are 300 feet long don't go over quick changes of hills or dips in the road very well. And so you take a, a 90 or 100 foot long platform trailer, it has to have gradual approach hills and, and, and the dips that it goes down into can't be very big or you end up breaking the spine of the trailer. Here's a better picture of that accident that I showed you earlier in India where they collapsed the bridge and they dropped that, uh, that gas generator there, gas turbine. So proper route planning hopefully will prevent these kind of accidents. And remember, the analysis of this bridge is something that, that can take a long time so that the sooner that you plan to get these uh, these route surveys in, you know, get the survey first, and then the analysis that follows up behind the route survey uh, is a big deal. And, and and you can see why a lot of guys choose to go with barges instead of platform trailers, uh, just to avoid all the issues associated with over the road transport. All right, so we've looked at the logistics associated with moving these things, everything from bringing the ship into a port to putting it on a barge or putting it on rail or putting it on a special transporter. But, but, but that's only one phase. That just gets us there. That's the logistics of getting to our job site. But what do we got to do on our job site to make sure that this, this load, this heavy transport, whatever way we're bringing it in, that our job site itself is ready to take it? And so we're going to look at ground support, everything from the haul road to the equipment support. Then we're going to take a look at project coordination, because these big loads, lots of things go on when big loads arrive. And then we'll talk real briefly about some special preps. Ground support. In, in my opinion, this is the single most important preparation a site can do in advance of receipt of heavy equipment, uh, both from the cranes you're going to use to do the lifting to the heavy loads themselves that arrive. You see here this picker has gotten himself in trouble, and the outriggers are smooshed down in the dirt, and he's about to flip over. So failure to perform proper analysis and the needed remediation on the soil uh, that where you're going to be working can spell failure for projects. Now, it, Different projects around the country are going to have different ground conditions. So, you know, if you're down in the Caliche down in Texas, I mean, you may take a couple soil borings and go, you know, the ground's going to be fine. If you're down in the swamps of Louisiana, you, you may actually have to uh, drive piles and put a pile cap on there just to put a, a regular size crane or crawler crane on your job site. So there's a lot of things that got to happen. We're going to talk about those just real briefly. So what does proper soil analysis look like? Um, it isn't going out there and stomping around in your boots and going, yeah, it feels pretty good to me. Um, generally, what you need to do if you've got heavy loads coming on your job site is do some proper soil testing. And that's going out there and taking borings, um, in particular where you're going to put your heavy loads, and looking at not just the surface. Those soil borings need to go down you know, 100, 150 feet and make sure you don't have a, a problem under the surface. Um, we were recently on a job where we had a very, very heavy, you know, one of the biggest cranes in the world that we were using, and the uh, and the contractor only looked at the, the surface condition and failed to look at the, the subsurface, what was happening 20 or 30 feet below there. And what they ended up finding was there was lots of clays and, uh, and some silty material that was 30 feet under the ground. So when this big, heavy crane walked across it, the surface wasn't the problem, but what you actually saw was pumping of the ground 30 or 40 feet beyond the tracks. 
and it started causing lots of problems with underground utilities, and uh, and and the crane itself was no longer uh, able to walk and stay stable, so they had to come back in and drive piles. Uh, but they, it was all because they failed to do proper soil analysis. So once you've got your analysis done, someone like a geotechnical engineer has got to come in there and design some remediation of your soil. And so some of that may be you just got to remove all the silty stuff and you got to come in with engineered fill. Some of it may just be a simple thing of putting in maybe some geo grids uh, for your haul road and, and covering it up. But someone's got to do a good design on that. And, and, and you particularly want to look at the areas where you have heavy equipment being stored or heavy equipment like big crawler cranes where they're going to be working. Uh, failure to consider those things can really be disastrous. Um, if those cranes were to fall over on your job site or you, you tump a load over on, it, on your haul route load because the soil gives way, um, it can really delay your job and can cause serious damage to your piece and worst case scenario get somebody severely hurt or killed. So here's an example of proper remediation. You can see the picture on the left here. We're down in this mud pit and uh, it's really a mess. And what ended up happening here, uh, we, we actually put in um, what they call rock piers where, where, where they come in and they drive with a vibratory hammer this, uh, this round casing and it goes down about 40 feet and then they, then they use this special device over here and they fill it up with stone and then they compact it with this compactor that you got shown here. And so what that does is that allows you to put a very stable, for inexpensive money, it builds a, a really stable platform. You can see right here we're picking this large vessel up in this mud, and we built this, uh, this platform so now the ground can take it. Had we tried to go in there with, with just these gantries and some mats in here on this muck, uh, we'd, have, we'd have been in trouble. So remediation uh, is a big deal here once you've done your proper analysis. So what about our haul roads? Uh, haul roads have got to not only be able to support your vehicular traffic, but like in this case, you've got this big generator coming in. Um, there's some pretty large loads being transferred to the ground with that SPMT. And so your haul roads got to consider not only vehicle regular traffic, but also things like this. You know, a good rule of thumb is if you can drive a, a concrete truck over your haul road, you probably can handle these kind of loads as well. But if you can't put a, haul, uh, a concrete truck on your roads, fully loaded, then you, you're definitely not going to be able to handle these big loads that these transporters put down. Sometimes for exceptional loads like crawler cranes, you may have done remediation that got you to three or 4,000 PSF with your, with your rock and other things, but it's still not good enough. And in that case, you're going to have to have matting material that you go on here. And you can see here we've got gantries that are in the background, and then they've also had a big crane sitting here. And this is uh, designed for supporting those big crane loads. You know, the tips of a crawler crane can put down 20,000 pounds per square foot if he's lifting over the edge of that tip. So those are very high loads. You need to have good engineering analysis to make sure that your ground is going to be adequate for you. Here's a super heavy crane. Um, this is one of Lamson's big cranes. Um, you may have to put piles down. And so you see over here in the right-hand side, this is where that crane was walking. We actually designed a pile cap uh, and then had to, had to come in here with pile drivers and drive steel H piles into the ground with caps on them and then backfill the uh, engineered fill over the top of them in order for this crane to do its work. And then even on top of that, we had mats sitting on top of all those piles. But this crane puts down very, very large loads. Um, so super heavy cranes, you're going to probably have a super heavy type of support that's going to be required. So let's talk about project coordination. Lay down in staging areas for heavy equipment can be a, a, a big consideration because real estate is premium on all jobs. And if you haven't thought about it, um, this is another thing that you can cause a lot of logistical bottlenecks in your job site. Look at your lower picture down there. You're, you're delivering HRSG modules into a very tight area. Well, those modules, you might have 15 HRSGs all sitting in a line. You've got to be able to deliver them, get them over, move them to the hook, and do it all efficiently. So you really need to spend some time looking at your laydown areas. You know, even things like where you're going to assemble your heavy cranes has got to be considered. So this is all part of your job site and, and project planning. 
this is a good picture to demonstrate that you've got a lot of things going on here and there's lots of crafts involved. And so here we're picking up a generator and walking it onto the, onto the pedestal of a power plant. And there's lots of work going on all around us. So coordinating what's going on for removal of interferences and making sure that when your heavy hauler arrives with the piece, you haven't built something in his way or you haven't built things that he can't, you know, he can't support his track down. So this is a big deal, making sure that you understand what the heavy hauler is going to do so you can coordinate well with your other contractors on your site so you don't end up with a scheduling nightmare. And then lastly, just coordinating so they understand what's going to happen as you start moving pieces around and making lifts. Um, it, it, you, know, you don't want to shut down all your other crafts unnecessarily. So again, good coordination, not just for interference removal, but for logistics. And you can see all these folks that are standing around here. Um, they're all not working, so good coordination will hopefully prevent all these guys from not working. And then there's lastly some site preparations. We we briefly talked, or we have talked about them, so I'm just going to briefly review them again. When you're talking about barging, it's typically cheaper than bringing in those heavy platform trailers, but in the roll-off area, you have some very unique considerations. This is a roll-off site that we were recently working on. This is what what it looked like. And so if you're going to use barges, you really, really, I'm going, to, I'm going to reiterate this again, need to consider how you're going to bring those barges in. So it went from a condition that looked like this in the top picture to the second picture where you can see they've got sheet piles that have been driven and they've dredged out an area where this barge can come in. And you can see the, the proper area here for the, taking the, the barge reactions. And then it's not only that, but you know, you just came into an improved embankment. Well, what are you going to do for the road to get it out of the out of the, the river bank and up onto your job site? So you may have a considerable roadway that you've got to build for those heavy components. And you, that's that's what this picture here shows. All right, so in summary, logistical planning and site preparation is going to play a large role in ensuring you've got safe and efficient heavy lifts and transports. So now I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to Zach and Mike for the rest of the presentation. OK. Uh, Jim, thanks very much for the, for the presentation to get us to this point on your summary. I'd like to bring to everybody's attention that uh, of the four items that we really wanted to target uh, primarily were logistical uh, considerations, site uh, considerations, project coordination, and lift planning, and that's part of where we're uh, going to be uh, diving off into just to, to wrap up our uh, webinar here. We have, um, I just uh, I talked to Jim before the program started, and I said, let me toss a few pictures up on uh, some load handling that we've worked with on uh, various client uh, project points, particularly offloading for some ship work, uh, ship to shore type uh, lifts. Um, we both have. Uh, uh, concerns about rigging methods that uh, get used. Uh, it may come; the unit may come from Korea, China, uh, lots of uh, lots of offshore locations, uh, Europe, and then they get handled multiple times before they get to us. To us, um, Jim, what are your thoughts on the, the synthetic rigging uh, connections here for the uh, for this transformer? Mike, I'm glad you asked. The um, about 12 years ago. We had a crane that was making a lift very similar to this and with the exact same rigging configuration they had. And my concern here would be the use of those synthetics wrapped around those sharp edges that are, that are, that are forming the sling points. Um, most of the time those, those sling points are designed for a hard, like a shackle or even a wire rope sling, but in either case, using a synthetic around any kind of edge uh, can lead to disaster. In this case, when we when we picked up that transformer, one of our slings actually cut through, and we ended up dropping that transformer. So, yeah. it is a uh, it 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 may look right, but those edges that are underneath those synthetic slings are really subject to some very high sharp corners, and uh, I would not recommend lifting like that. So so even with all the planning that you just covered uh, for all of us. Um, it, it gets down to actually picking the item itself. Even that contact point right there can be can just finish the whole day, uh, you know, in a disastrous way. And that can happen to any of us anywhere, anytime. It's it's not 
uh, we, we've successfully delivered the unit right next to where it has to be set, and then we missed this step. We're in big, deep trouble here. I noticed that a lot of wire ropes will score and gouge those pick points previously handled at other locations, and synthetic rigging gets attached to it, and uh, they can slice in a heartbeat. So it's, um, but we see it in, on lots of different types of loads every day. Um, Jim, this is a bit about what you were talking about, about transferring that pick point and letting hard uh, shackles help uh, serve as sacrificial high, you know, high rated component to go to dive in there. And then we rig either wire rope slings or synthetic slings to those shackle pins that are smooth and round and, you know, and appropriate. So we can step off those pick points sometimes to help us uh, get the load moved uh, properly. Yeah, it's a great point, Mike. Um, Let's take a look. I got a few more, and uh, you may have some other comments. Uh, the uh, these are coming off. These have been shackled right to the uh, lifting lugs, and the, these are handled in a variety of ways, of course. And uh, shackles. We'll see a lot of braided wire rope slings, and they all should be inspected. All rigging has got to be inspected um, at whatever transfer point we have for the load handling project. So. Uh, there, a lot of folks have different uh, different approaches uh, to their depth of their inspection. I see slings that are still covered up, wire rope slings that are still covered um, with wrapping. A lot of times I'll just stop the job and say, let's cut all that stuff off. We've got to look, is it corroded? Do we have torn and ripped wires? Do we, you know, you can't see uh, to make the inspection. So notice some, uh, some of these on this transformer, we have good uh, lifting trend ends. It's good also to check for scoring and gouging. And then that edge plate right there, that can be a real, that can be a uh, knee knocker right there, where the slings, if they're loaded on with a spreader bar, but then loaded straight to a, to a single hook, those slings are going to break over that edge plate right on, on the top plate for that transformer. So all the planning in the world uh, isn't, you know, can't uh, uh, sometimes avoid or stop uh, poor contact or poor connection points, and that it, it cannot be left out of the plan. We've got to make sure we've got good connections. Um, this would be an ideal place for a spreader uh, going crosswise, and then the slings coming down to each corner uh, to keep those uh, contact potentials out of the way. So nice long slings. The longer the slings we have, the, the, the less angle we have, of course, and the ability to keep the slings off the side there. And uh, I thought this was a little humorous. Jim, we got a. Uh, the load in is a substructure for another component, and it was about 60 tons or so. And then uh, notice these pad eyes. I'm not quite sure how they loaded this off uh, from uh, overseas, but we had a nearly impossible time finding a shackle that would fit into this this lifting lug. It must have been the young engineer's first day on the job. I'm not sure, but um, even something like that, Jim, uh, can stop the show, can it? I mean, it's, uh, it can be sig insignificant little elements, but all of a sudden you just can't handle it because of the, uh, the connection point. Yeah, Mike, I wish I could tell you that's a, that's a rare event, but <laughs> sometimes that seems like we run into that a lot. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look then. Um, and in the uh, P30 group um, that we're both a part of, uh, this, these are the ten points. So this is the the fourth fourth item that Zach's talked about for our uh, presentation today. And in this, there are ten subsets. And I do want to bring them to your attention uh, to the to our listeners, to our participants here today. The uh, we have these broke up uh, in and really moving the load and, and considering all the elements with it. The, the load itself and what is its structural integrity, how is it going to react to the different um, uh, rigging methods that might be opportune? Do we have to push it up underneath? Can we lift it from the top? Do we have to pick and turn the load? What's the rotation capability? Uh, how, what's the headroom requirements and all those things? And will the load maintain its structure based in the, in the orientation we've got to put it? And will it, can it freestand uh, on temporary dunnage or does it have to be landed? Um, to the hard foundation that is target point immediately. Um, center gravity is always an issue, and so it is uh, weight. You know, we go back to basic rigging. It's, it's what's the load weight, where's the CG, and what's the rigging method. 
and that's all about controlling the load and making things happen right. So uh, second consideration point, Jim, that we've identified um, is uh, the LHEs, as you've presented the entire uh, uh, session here about, is the adequacy, rate of capacity, uh, all the elements go with it within the right configuration. The rigging method, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, a little bit more on this. Uh, we actually have a contest for everybody to participate in uh, at the closing of this, and uh, I'll share more of that with you. But the rigging equipment, uh, I, I am seeing a lot of folks going away from synthetic rigging in some cases, uh, more towards uh, wire rope slings, braided slings. Just sometimes you, you just can't find that sling protection that's going to provide uh, continuous um, defense for the rigging. And then, of course, adequacy, and then making sure that we, we know what the loads are going to be around uh, at the various pick points. And the ability to use spreader bars to help hinge and, and equalize the loading to all sling legs, hence all pick points. So all those, all those elements start to play in and what size rigging we're going to need to attack that load with. Something, Jim, that you covered heavily this morning uh, was on the LHE and load path. Uh, and travel path uh, is a huge element around the power plant, uh, and not everything's uh, Jim Bob flat. You know, it's uh, sometimes we've got some inclines and some banked curves and all kinds of things that can throw us throw us uh, a curve. Uh, and then personnel assignment, uh, task assignment for different personnel, and there may be uh, parties and groups of folks that deal with various stages, stage one, two, and three of. It's outside the plant. There's a personnel group assigned to that. It's inside the plant. We're covering that. And then this may be the lift planning team to actually place the load. So personnel uh, assignments all the way through are uh, uh, elements that project managers have to oversee and really get the right square peg, square hole to get the right folks with the right talents to do the right job. So let's finish up. This is uh, what I'm sharing with everybody is this is sort of the current thinking within P30. And those first five items uh, and the next five here round out the uh, items really under consideration for critical lift planning. And it's not set in stone yet. It is still in consideration mode, but it is something that uh, is, it's getting pretty close. And I think we'll, we'll be landing on these 10 items as the primary little, uh, lift plan development points that any project site should take on in their consideration mode. Uh, as Jim noted, the site uh, services ancillary equipment uh, gosh, we've got to have uh, uh, JLGs and uh, uh, man lifts and uh, sometimes uh, man baskets to help access our rigging connections or handling connections. Uh, but site services also get into uh, safety and, and coordination of traffic patterns, folks to, to uh, site to barricade and make sure we've got the ability to keep the rigging team uh, secured for doing what they're doing and keep people out of the bike. Communication system obviously is a huge deal, uh, and of course we have qualified signal persons now required for construction projects, and uh, whether it's radios, hand signals, whatever combination it's going to be, site control gets down to uh, maintaining the, the access as required. Contingency considerations, that gets down to if we, it's sort of the, the what if stage, which drives most of us crazy, but uh, because you can what, a, what if a job to complete uh, standstill. But once you really de de decided these are the real risk points, what's real? What is the, what is, what's the probable, most probable uh, el elements that we're going to run into? It could be uh, high winds, <coughs> cold temperatures, uh, immediate uh, storm fronts moving through, things that uh, sort of pop up. And, you, and you've got to make a decision in advance. If we get to this point, Here's, here's our decision tree as we're going to uh, make the adjustments necessary. And then most all sites have an emergency action plan, but the rigging crew, the lift plan crew, needs to be made aware of that and what is their role in that. Uh, they normally won't uh, develop it themselves, but they will attend to it uh, and be uh, prepared to uh, respond uh, should they have some issue. And it could be, uh, in some cases, uh, we could have uh, uh, chemical release of some type, and uh, where do we have to evacuate to, who's dedicated to do what. Sometimes I know in certain plants uh, we've got operators that have a Scott Air Pack and positive air system and a mask to be able to, to in the cab with him to get him 
give him time to get out of the cab appropriately and then evacuate the area. Just strange things, but you know what? Planning is, is uh, the real answer to, to a successful operation. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, lift plan development is um, really uh, for final setting. Uh, typically, we have four different uh, segments to that at a, as a base. One is the lift data sheet that really is dealing with the LAG and the load. Uh, the second item is uh, the, a lot of the rigging information that has to do with attaching con and the configurations thereof, spreader bars, lifting beams, wide body shackles, and so on. Then the uh, travel path and personnel, where do we want to go with the load, the LHE, and where do we want the people assigned to help secure that load to its final place, and then lift procedures and the sequence. And this is really critical because we get down to um, we really want to do follow a plan of attack here, steps one through through uh, seven or eight, and we get down to once we accomplish that, we'll have a uh, stop and evaluate point, and then we're going to execute these next four steps, and who's doing what when, and it's kind of a time. It's really it's a script. You might say you might think that it's uh, well well organized, um, and it's it's like a an entire uh, sequence of uh, a lot of team members falling into the right point, right place, right time, performing the right work. So that sequence is uh, all critical to making sure some, the uh, project um, hits everything on, on all, all cylinders. So these are uh, four document samples of what we talked about. Obviously, these are uh, tough to see, but we have included um, blanks of these for you, uh, for all the participants that have, been, uh, that have joined us here. And so our lift data sheet is uh, right up here first. And then we have uh, travel path and personnel. And we have load schematic and rigging. And we have the, the sequence of uh, lift activities and the procedures associated with those. So it can be, uh, uh, you know, it could be one or two pages. It might be 16, 20, or 100 pages by the time you get done. But those four elements are, are pretty much the core, uh, core items that need to be addressed. Um, we do have a contest here for you, and how this kind of goes, uh, this contest is a document package that was sent to you before, and we can certainly get it to you afterwards if you don't have it. There are uh, gifts for the first, second, and third prizes that we have, and so let me explain a little bit about that to you. We, we've sent you a, a document a package that includes um, a small Manitowoc load chart, so you'll have a... Uh, have a certain number of pages uh, access to you for uh, block capacity, rope, um, range diagram, and load chart. And uh, then we have, also we have uh, illustrations of the item we want to move. There's a, it's a 70 ton load, 44 uh, foot long basically, and uh, the pick points at one end are uh, 14 feet and 4 feet, and the center gravity is offset this is a load that actually uh, I had to review and uh, help develop the lift plan for and get the rigging gear together for a client up in uh, Seattle for a large uh, large offload. So that's that's part of this. This is um, this is kind of what it looks like. And this is also in your package. After it's all finally assembled, uh, it's certainly taller than would say 12 feet here, but 12 foot is, was the shipping package size by 44 by uh, 14. So that's sort of what that looks like, and this is why all that center of gravity is all clustered up to one end. So that's in our package. It's just this is a simile document, and we end up with uh, for you is the task. Well, what is it we're asking you to do? And one, it's uh, the task is to lift and set the compressor to a landing height of 42 feet with the load center of gravity um, 100 feet in from the building edge, and that looks. Um, there's basically a, as a crane pad prepared that gives you uh, an idea where we can set this crane. We've got to go in 100 feet on the top of this building to our landing point, and the height is 42 feet. So the, uh, we do have a sample uh, four-page lift plan for you, and it is a, it's sort of the four-sheet item that we provided uh, an example of just a little bit ago. The data page com, uh, completes with the load information, the crane, hoist rope, the reeving, the rigging, of course, 
crane placement. It talks about con contingency plans and geotech uh, information, some of which you won't be, uh, since we have a good crane pad, we don't need to deal with that. We've got that qualified by the uh, planning group. Then, of course, we have uh, four follow-on pages <clears throat> that talk about load travel path, personnel, and then we have the uh, load schematic and rigging, and then we have load handling uh, sequence and procedures. So those are the four items that we're looking for to get from you. And let me get um, let me get back to the plan point. And so we've got the compressor that's got to go up on top. And then we'll be asking you if you'd like to use your own, uh, you could use the critical lift plan, the four-page document that's been provided to you, or certainly you could provide your own. And so what we'd like to see is, uh, either your your lift plan or the four-page document and you have all the other items that you need we've got a load chart for the crane and by the way uh, we did uh, get a really nice uh, segment out for you and lifting gear higher has got an awesome website uh, and you want to take a look online but this is uh, this is about a 40 page extract out of their rigging section they've got slings, uh, shackles. I started here on on what you'd see is page 196, but they've got nice uh, slings that will go up to, in this case, uh, 200 ton. So they've got a whole sling, sling arrangement. And then we've got shackles, of course. They've got a whole uh, terrific tool selection list for all kinds of rigging. And so we've provided this rigging uh, segment for you from Lifting Gear Higher. We certainly appreciate their participation. They, uh, we've used them twice on uh, project sites. Uh, just rent the gear quickly. The, the appropriate size is basically uh, quite often as requested, proof tested. Uh, cert certifications can come with it. And then uh, we use that gear, uh, get done with it, ship it back. So we don't have to own everything. It's much simpler to lease it or rent it for a short period of time and then uh, send it back and, and it'll be reused downstream. So they've got uh, standard shackles, wide body shackles, and uh, on the particular job we were on, we uh, ended up using some modular bars. And let me get to, uh, these are mod bars that, uh, in this case, they've got 50 ton capacity modular bars, uh, and as the bar is extended, the, the capacity, of course, lowers, but, but they've even got uh, down to uh, uh, heavy lift bars, and in this case, these are this is a modular 1000-700, and these are monster bars. These are 700 ton capacity going down to 256 ton capacity. So, and basically, you pick the length you need, and uh, the modular bar can come in, get bolted up accordingly, and uh, then the shackles uh, are accommodating to the uh, bar as needed. It's just a terrific method and system to be able to. Uh, instead of maintaining all of the tens and tens of thousands of dollars of inventory on your shelf, using it every two or three years sometimes, um, you can rent this equipment very quickly and it's delivered, assembled, and ready to go. So uh, that package has been provided for you as well to help accommodate for this contest. So it's so basically it's, a, it's, it's not a terrifically large load. It's a 70-ton compressor, and we just need to pick it up and move it onto the top of that uh, building structure. We've got suitable uh, landing for it. And uh, we're, I'm just asking you to complete the lift plan and submit it. Make sure you've got all the data for the plan, for the load, for the crane, for the rigging. What rigging do you want to use? How do you want to build your rigging? Because you've got all the dimensions for the load and, and all the pick points are available to you. Identification of center gravity has been provided. So how do we want to pick that up? And the load comes uh, uh, in the package that you'll see. Uh, we've got the details for you for the dimensions and center gravity, distance. On the south end, the pick points are 14 feet apart. On the north end, the pick points are only 4 feet apart. So it gives you a little perspective. The slings really have to come straight up and off that load structure. There's no angular loading inboard that's permitted. You might have a little angle going outboard. But uh, uh, this, the, we won't be able to uh, encroach upon that load's uh, footprint 
with rigging going in inboard. So then there's power line information. There's no power lines within 300 feet of the target area. And the crane is uh, has enough boom to assemble that crane up to 260 feet if you need that. So we've provided you the information. This is the task. Here's sort of the task description. And you've got all the tools to make that happen. So uh, we'd like for you to, uh, for those who would like to participate, we'd love to have you um, complete this and then send this in. Uh, it's on the document by as, as it is uh, on that Word document. But send it in to Zach at ITI.com by uh, February 28th, and that's only about eight days away. And then there will be uh, there there will be three judges that uh, from ITI and Barnhart. I uh, will probably ask Zach to black out any uh, names of persons so that we don't have any uh, 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 knowledge of who might who has submitted it until after we make the final decision. And uh, but we'll have a three panel judge where a group will select the first, second, and third uh, uh, winners for that, and then we'll announce that at a, at our next webinar. So. We'd love to have you participate. There's some great prizes for the uh, for the winners, and the, the uh, prizes are, uh, uh, as we said, ranging from two two fifty to uh, one hundred and fifty in our bookstore. And so there's a whole host of videos, books, cards, reference cards, all crane and rigging related that you'd be able to uh, uh, redeem to help build your library up. So. It is a great way to add to your library. You might spend an hour and get this thing knocked out and email it to Zach, and then we'd uh, be able to uh, select the winners right out of that group. So I'd like to kind of close out today uh, questions and answers. And Zach, maybe you have some questions that folks have uh, notified you about that it, for Jim or myself that we can help uh, resolve. Sure do. Um, let me just hop right into it. Jim Kruger had asked a question prior to the event. Uh, trying to understand, and I think after watching the presentation, at what phase of design, and this is really for Jim, at what phase of design should a project manager interact with a company like Barnhart to aid the crane installation in a nuclear plant? Well, that's a good. It's a great question. Um, we we have done it on on all different <laughs> phases of a project, and and I'll give you some examples on that. Let, let's say you're a project manager and uh, you're getting ready to uh, start doing your planning. Um, a, a company like Barnhart, um, we can be employed at the very beginning of the job to help you do route surveys, to figure out what, um, what issues you're going to run into. Um, we can also start looking and helping you with uh, um, doing some preliminary uh, test or uh, lift planning, and, and, and what I mean by that is if you've got the pieces and you know how big they are and you know what you're going to do in your site plan, having a rigger and a heavy hauler on board in your preliminary planning can help you with your preliminary lift plans to actually size your equipment. So instead of being locked into a contractor telling you, well, you know, here's, here's my big piece of equipment, you might contact somebody like us who can help you plan the job and look for more efficient sizes based on how you actually put the work together. So um, I would say the earlier that we get involved, um, the better it is for your planning. In, in companies like ours, um, a lot of times we'll, we can help you with that for free, uh, where we sit and say, let us put some preliminary stuff together for you. Um, you, you may want really detailed information like an engineered lift plan or an engineered survey or a, an engineered route study uh, where you pay a company like ours or, or a consulting company uh, to come in and actually do um, more detailed studies where you're paying them on a, a T&M basis or maybe a lump sum or, 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 or whatever it is. But um, we have helped our, our clients from the very beginning of arrival of the ship um, all the way to the end of how we coordinate with the subcontractors on their job sites and helping them put together um, their haul roads. Um, generally, you'll find the sooner you get your heavy rigor involved, the better it's going to be and the, the easier your, your job goes. Um, and, and there's lots of guys out there like our companies that are willing to talk to you and just have the discussion and say, here's the things you need to probably look at. Um, 
you know, whenever we bid a job, the sooner we're involved, usually the better and more smooth the job goes for our for our client. Uh, because there are so many things to consider, and if you haven't done it before, um, it, it it generally helps. Now, if you've got a lot of experience moving stuff around, and you really and you really got good in-house people that can do some of those um, preliminary looks at sizing of cranes and understand how to move logistical uh, big pieces around, then you know maybe you don't need our help as much. So, uh, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that was great, Jim. Thank you. I I think. Uh I, before I get into the other questions, uh, some people have been raising their hands, and what I'd like you guys to do actually is, I, I, for instance, David and Craig, I typed out questions to you guys if you had questions, but you can put your questions in the questions pane or the uh, chat pane, so on the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. So a uh, question came in from Mike. Uh, if you need to ensure proper ship position at the docks, who do you coordinate with? Uh, and he asked, is it the harbor master? So Jim, this goes back, he passed this back in the uh, uh, early part of your presentation. So, Yeah, yeah, it's another good question. The, um, um, a lot of times the, the, uh, the ports don't, don't have a plan until right before they're making their moves. And so getting with the guy who is, who is the, um, the dock master as well as the the uh, transport company that's arranging the movement and, and getting with them and saying, okay, here's the, here's the situation that we have. You know, uh, like some ports have got an area where they, where they typically do heavy offload. And so coordinating with those, those guys early on, whether it's, the, whether it's the dock master, the port master, or just the shipping authority themselves, um, that really needs to be done before that ship arrives. Um, or, or you can get in a scenario, and we've had this happen before, where the ship arrives with a heavy load and he's on the wrong dock. And so then, then when the, you know, when the when the heavy hauler arrives on the scene, he's over there saying, "Well, I, I can't take delivery here." And so then you got to move the ship around. And so the um, the earlier that is, the better. So 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 getting a hold of the port authority and getting them to coordinate with whoever that dock master is going to be and get them in touch with your shipper and your transporter, making those three guys work together is really, really key to making sure that that ship gets in the right place. Or at least you have a plan that if you're going to move it, that your plan doesn't, it, that, that it's smooth, it's a smooth flowing plan and not a, 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 a herky-jerky kind of um, thing. Okay, good point. Awesome. Uh, a comment came in from Jim Wool, and you guys, this is actually the gentleman that will be presenting next month's webinar. And it was Jim, again, uh, regarding uh, early on in your presentation, but Jim mentioned a uh, good point concerning uh, geared heavy lift ships. He's witnessed two accidents of any impact, and one of them was where the load line on, t on one of the two cranes broke with an 800-ton reactor on the hook. So he mentioned had the reactor been boomed out a few more feet, this would have been a just a catastrophic event. So I think that was more a comment than a question. But Jim, if, if you'd like to respond in any way, please do. Yeah, Jim and I are probably probably are familiar with the same same one. I believe that was in the Port of Los Angeles. Um, the fortunate part was on that on that lift that only one of the LHE's load lines broke. Had both of them broken, the ship would have flipped over backwards, um, which really would have been disastrous. So again, the importance of verifying the the condition of those LHEs is really important, and, and and sometimes it's hard to figure out who that is. If if you're doing multiple subcontracts um, in your in your planning, um, sometimes it's hard to figure out who's responsible for what. But as the but as the end user, and you're the guy doing the installation, you really have to get into the details to understand who's responsible for ensuring the proper delivery. And so, who's got the LHE? And, and really asking those hard questions to make sure that we don't we don't end up with something getting overlooked, like the inspection of the LHE. Do you know, okay, I'll make a comment about that uh, because the you know it, there's a, it's almost unforgivable to have a hoist rope fail, and I say that only because the uh, design factor is really there to help you. It's such a high wear and high use item, but a boom hoist uh, could typically have a three to one design factor up uh, and up main hoist could be three and a half to one or up to five to one. So 
we have so much reserve strength in the rope that we really have to have a lot of broken wires, corrosion, or other kinds of damage that would compromise that rope. So the uh, it, it's to have to actually lose a hoist rope during a lift is that somebody's really, really missed their assignment. And inspection of all equipment, as Jim and Jim have both said, uh, is critical and key to, to the overall success. And of course, Mike, the higher the capacity that you're pushing the LHE, um, the more critical it becomes to verify that that equipment is, is really working well. Not that you right. blow it off if it's a low capacity, but it just heightens the risk as you move up into the into the capacity chart of those cranes. And a lot of our clients have have, have put administrative restrictions which which are good that say if we reach this certain capacity of our LHE, then then they've got other things that start coming into play that help them manage the risk. And so those could be anything from load testing to a to a full new inspection of the equipment. And so those are all those are all good things to help manage risk. Excellent point. Thank you, guys. Um, I have a couple of questions come in that I want to answer really quick about the contest. Uh, Craig asked, uh, for instance, will you publish the winning three lift plans, not just uh, who the winners, uh, not just to the winners? So, Mike, I don't know if that was yes. Uh, plan, but... We will. We will with their permission. And so we just need to, we'll contact them in advance, and with their permission, we would be able to publish them. Without, we wouldn't, so. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then if you guys, I'll let everyone know, if you're having any trouble getting all the files, please email me at zach at ita.com. I can download them all fine from the uh, website. Uh, I've heard a couple people say they've had trouble with the Excel document, um, so I just want to make sure it's all working well. So um, another question, uh, this is for either Jim or Mike, has ASME made any guideline standards for have, uh, handling heavy lift loads in connection to ships and barges? Uh, let me uh, take a swing at that uh, just a second. And I, I, I will say that really the development and the delivery of the ASME P30 for load handling Will be sort of will be the document of choice, and then from from that it references all of the other B30 type equipment, which will be uh, barge mounted cranes, and it'll be mobile cranes, uh, pedestal cranes, all the other types. We do not reference um, shipboard cranes as a general rule. So those are unique and not within the ASME family, but um, and then of course all of the the uh, rigging for slings and the rigging hardware is of course, and then uh, spreader bars, uh, B30.20 and BTH-1. So from a rigging standpoint, all of the uh, rigging gear is there, and then all of the LHEs as Jim's described are covered under B30, which will be uh, all referenced under the P30 uh, main document. So, um, to, th so, so yes, as a family, yes, they are, they are all referenced, and we would tie those documents together per the lifting and load handling application. I will say that uh, we, are, we are actively uh, proposing, and this is just a proposal, um, Jim, uh, it's on uh, SPMTs. Um, and we already have uh, telescopic uh, hydraulic gantry systems within B30.1 for jacking. Well, of course, we have jacks there as well. But within this B30.1, we are proposing to put in uh, self-propelled modular transporters and because they're actually used for jacking as well and for transporting. So that is a proposal. We'll entertain that in May. Uh, I believe with the main committee of B30 to see if we can get that included. And then uh, uh, that'll take a little bit of time to get integrated into the B30.1 document if we can get it, uh, get it on its feet and the main committee will approve that. So we're really trying very hard to, to lasso in all of the different kinds of equipment that we are currently using in all industries within this B30 and P30 arena. I hope that helps answer. 
Yeah, that, that looks great, actually. That's a pretty well-rounded answer. And I think, um, well, you know my opinion on, on having all that involved in ASME. So um, Stephen asked one last question, guys. Anybody else have any questions, make sure you type them in. I think we're about ready to wrap up here. But um, and I've been asked this question before myself, actually, regarding our heavy lift. Well, we're doing some workshops, and we have one in Edmonton called the Heavy Rigging and Lifting Workshop. But Stephen is from Denmark, I believe, and um, he asked, and Jim, you might be able to answer this, what uh, tonnage level are seen in the U.S. are considered heavy loads? Or um, could you, or maybe I can ask it this way, Jim, and maybe you can describe to everybody um, some different stages of how Barnhart breaks out uh, capacities and and how you guys analyze the type of transport and load you're going to be uh, project you're going to be handling. Do, can you touch on that? Yeah, yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna couch it this way. Um, there are I mean everybody has a different position on what's a heavy load. Um, generally, when you start talking about the things that I was getting into, where you got platform trailers or specialized transporters. Um, those are different uh, a classification from from loads that can be handled on like a multi-axle, 19-axle rig, rig or something like that. And, and that generally goes up to around 180 to 200,000 pounds. Um, as soon as you get beyond those numbers with your weight, um, you're generally not going to be dealing with a what, what I would call a commoditized transporter where it's where you know it's a, a drop deck uh, you know, multi-axle thing you see running down the road, those are only good for about 150 to 180, 190,000 pounds. You start getting over that number, and now you start getting into requirements for very specialized gear, um, like the things I showed on there. So, so that's for transporting. That's where I would say you'd, you'd start having your dividing lines. Right around that 200,000 mark, um, you're going to have to consider different things than if you are less than 200,000 down in the 150 range, because then a um, a, uh, a more commoditized transporter can take it. So that's for transports. Now for lifting, um, everybody seems to have their own definition of what a heavy load is. If you're at a nuclear plant, they define heavy loads as anything heavier than a fuel bundle. Well, a fuel bundle typically will weigh 1,500 pounds. So in, at a nuclear plant, if you're working around safety-related equipment, a heavy load is greater than 1,500 pounds. Um, the refineries typically will define their loads not by their weight but by the capacity of whatever's lifting them. And so if, if the load weighs 2,000 pounds and the capacity is only 2,500 pounds, and they may say, well, you're, you're within the, a percentage of the load, so we're going to consider that requiring a critical lift. And so the, the weights need to be related to whatever's picking them up, and that's generally how most of the, the folks that we work with they will define in their administrative guidelines of what type of lift plan that they're going to use or they're going to ask you to provide them when you come on their job sites. And so it's a, um, you know, some folks have put a number on it, but I don't think the number is the whole story. I, I think it's got to be the weight and then the capacity of the LHE, and then that helps you better manage your risk associated with your lift. And that's what most companies, uh, the bigger, uh, refineries, new plants, and those guys have, have used that similar type of arrangement. What's the capacity? What's the weight? And then I've got guidelines in there depending on what the percentage of the capacity is. Okay, terrific. Thanks for that answer, Jim. That helps. That'll help me in the future answer that question as well. So, um, Mike, that's every. That's all the questions. So um, I want to just real quick thank everyone for joining, and I really want to thank Jim. Uh, we do this every month, and Jim's been on twice, like I said, and it's Jim. It's just an absolute pleasure having you on. It, it's, uh, I don't know if everyone, uh, I've been getting a lot of great feedback but um, from everybody attending, but we have two very high, high caliber folks in the industry on including, and Jim, you're uh, just an incredible resource for everybody. So, And we thank you for getting a presentation together, everybody. The presentation will be available on the website. You'll be getting an email after this webinar uh, showing you a link to it. So uh, what an incredible resource from Jim and uh, Mike to have that presentation and uh, knowledge. So thank you both very much. You're welcome, Jack.
Okay, thank you guys, and we really look forward to uh, having you join us on future webinars. And it's been a terrific uh, time today. It's uh, we we all I I learn something every day in this industry, and it's uh, it's just something that you're able to help others with and uh, make for successful operations. So uh, these are terrific, uh, fun events, and we do certainly appreciate uh, all the participants that join us each time. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.